Um, I have the pleasure today of introducing Dr. Tatum Mortimer, who's an assistant professor here at UGA in the Department of Population Health at the College of Veterinary Medicine. It's not her first time at UGA. She also got her undergraduate degree here in microbiology and genetics. Then she moved on to get a PhD from, in microbiology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, studying recombination and selection in bacterial pathogens, and then went on to do a postdoc at the T.H. Chan School of Public Health at Harvard, working on antibiotic resistance in Neisseria gonorrhea. And today she'll be talking to us more about her work on Neisseria gonorrhea. So thank you, everyone. Let's welcome Dr. Mortimer. Thanks everyone for, for coming and thank you everyone who's on Zoom for joining. I hope that uh, you can hear me. If not, please uh, let me know. Um, like Olivia said, I am a new assistant professor here in the Department of Population Health and my study or my lab uses whole genome sequencing to study the evolution and transmission of infectious diseases in animal and human populations. Uh, so a lot of my work is focused on, let me get the slide to change, <laughs> is focused on addressing the public health threat of antimicrobial resistance. So the CDC estimates that over 35,000 people die every year from an antibiotic resistant infection. And unfortunately, the uh, development pipeline for new antimicrobials has really slowed in the last uh, few decades. And so now that these pathogens are becoming more resistant to antibiotics, we don't have a lot of options left to treat them. And so we really uh, need to both reduce the acquisition and spread of antimicrobial resistance in our pathogen populations, but also develop new public health and clinical interventions in addition to new antimicrobials to treat these antibiotic resistant infections. I use uh, Neisseria gonorrhea as a, a kind of a model system to understand how AMR evolves in bacterial pathogens. Uh, Neisseria gonorrhea or gonococcus is a gram negative diplococcus. It is the causative agent of the sexually transmitted infection gonorrhea. So during normal infection, it's kind of infecting and transmitting the mucosal surfaces in the cervix, urethra, pharynx, and rectum. However, it can also cause more severe outcomes like pelvic inflammatory disease, which leads to infertility, uh, conjunctivitis, which in babies can lead to blindness, as well as disseminated gonococcal infections. In the pre-antibiotic era, uh, gonorrhea was actually one of the leading causes of endocarditis or heart infections in young people. And while we hit a historic low in 2009, since that time, uh, the rates of gonorrhea have been rapidly increasing. I told you that I use gonococcus as a uh, model system to study antimicrobial resistance evolution. And as you can see, like many bacterial pathogens, gonococcus has evolved resistance to antibiotics shortly after they were introduced in the clinic. So on the timeline, that would be in the light blue and purple. Now, treatment guidelines for gonorrhea are really set based on population levels of resistance. And so usually what um, the CDC uses to determine whether or not an antibiotic should be used for treatment is whether or not less than 5% of the gonococcal population is resistant to that antibiotic. So what this means is that as uh, antibiotic resistance has emerged and spread in the gonococcal population, we have lost multiple antibiotic classes for gonorrhea treatment. And you can see that on the dark blue on this timeline. More recently, in 2020, uh, because of growing azithromycin resistance, we had a, a transition from what used to be dual therapy with azithromycin and ceftriaxone to monotherapy with ceftriaxone. Well, the problem with uh, monotherapy with ceftriaxone is it's really kind of our last line antibiotic for gonorrhea, uh, and we have seen treatment failures globally uh, with ceftriaxone treatment. Here in the United States, last year in Boston, the Massachusetts Department of Public Health detected two cases with reduced susceptibility to ceftriaxone. So these weren't treatment failures yet, but they did have reduced susceptibility, as well as resistance to every other antibiotic we've ever used for gonorrhea treatment. Uh, so I suspect that we will be seeing more of these cases here in the United States. And, you know, eventually we will meet this 5% threshold for ceftriaxone as well. <clears throat> 
And so uh, I have been using genomics to help uh, address this issue of antimicrobial resistance. And so I'm gonna just tell you a little bit about some of the work that I've done uh, using genomics to predict uh, susceptibility from, from the genome as well as identify new genetic mechanisms that are contributing to antibiotic susceptibility, identifying targets for point of care diagnostics that predict susceptibility in the clinic, as well as understanding what the potential impacts of new interventions like doxycycline post-exposure prophylaxis might have on antimicrobial resistance in gonococcus. So I'll start with uh, predicting susceptibility from genomes. I know that not everyone in here is a microbiologist, so I just thought I'd tell you a little bit about how we measure antimicrobial susceptibility um, in the lab. So most uh, susceptibility information that uh, diagnostic labs, clinical labs, you know, research labs are using is, is something called the minimum inhib inhibitory concentration, which is a semi-quantitative measure of resistance. And so basically what you're looking for is the minimum concentration of an antibiotic that prevents growth of that bacteria. So you can either do that by serially diluting the antibiotic in media or uh, using these test strips that have a gradient of antibiotic concentrations and then looking for the zone of inhibition uh, where the uh, antibiotic is inhibiting bacterial growth. And I say this is semi-quantitative because we don't test every possible concentration of the antibiotic. Often it's in a sort of doubling dilution. So you're testing one microgram per mil and then two and then four and so on and so forth. Most bacterial whole genome sequencing data uses this uh, kind of general strategy when we're thinking about uh, doing surveillance for important pathogens um, or uh, sequencing in a clinical context. So DNA is extracted from single colony isolates that have been cultured from patient samples. And so because we're picking a single colony isolate, we're really assuming that this one bacterial cell is representative of the population within a patient, which you know may or may not be true. Um, then we you know extract DNA from that culture, and most whole genome sequencing in bacteria for the last you know, decade or so has been done with Illumina. So these are short reads um, that we then kind of take a multi-pronged assembly strategy. We often do de novo assembly, but because of repeats in the bacterial genomes and these short reads, you know, we're getting assemblies that aren't perfectly resolved into a nice um, circle. Here I'm showing a bandage plot. I don't know if you guys have ever looked at assembly graphs uh, with this kind of plot, but I think it's a really neat software to kind of explore uh, the very complicated graph associated with uh, bacterial genomes with many repeats. And then we also like to map to a reference genome where it's a little bit simpler to just identify single high variants um, and create alignments for downstream analyses like phylogenetics. Part of the reason that we uh, take this multi-pronged strategy is because Gonococcus encodes diverse mechanisms of antimicrobial resistance. Uh, not only are the you know, biological mechanisms diverse, so you can have reduced entry through the porin, efflux of the drug back out of the cell, or modifications to the antibiotic or the antibiotic's target, but the genetic mechanisms leading to those phenotypes can be quite varied. So you know, we have our single nucleotide variants, insertions and deletions that cause frame shifts or even in-frame insertions or deletions. But we also have things like gene presence absence. So not all gonococci encode the same genome or genes. And so, you know, that's why it's important for us to look at the de novo assembly to look for changes in the accessory gene content. Neisseria gonorrhea is also, also naturally transformable. So it picks up DNA from its environment, including from bacteria, that live in our pharynx, which are closely related other uh, commensal Neisseria that are exposed to antibiotics all the time and have evolved resistance. And so when they pick up these genes from other Neisseria, we get these sort of mosaic alleles that are part, partly derived from Neisseria gonorrhea, but partly derived from these um, other diverse Neisseria. 
Uh, so some antibiotic susceptibility is really well explained by even just like a single nucleotide variant. So here I'm showing an example of ciprofloxacin susceptibility and a SNP in uh, a gene called gyr A, which encodes for the DNA gyrase, which is the target of ciprofloxacin. So just one non-synonymous mutation in this gene causes ciprofloxacin resistance. You can see on the histogram that um, isolates with this uh, SNP have much higher MICs, which are over the breakpoint for susceptibility compared to isolates with a wild type allele of gyre However, unfortunately, most of the other antibiotics um, cannot be predicted from just a single variant because there are multiple mechanisms of resistance, like I talked about a few slides ago. Uh, so you can see uh, on these histograms the, the distribution of these MICs and Ciprofloxacin has a nice, clean, bimodal distribution that is perfectly separated by this one SNP, whereas all of the other uh, distributions, even if they are bimodal, the actual cutoff for susceptibility or resistance is somewhere, you know, right near the peak of where MICs are. So uh, instead, what we do is use linear models to uh, include include all known variants and predict MICs. And when we do that, we actually do get pretty good uh, positive predictive values for predicting susceptibility and resistance. So while uh, linear models are pretty good at predicting MICs, we do sometimes see that some isolates have reverted from antibiotic resistance to susceptibility. So uh, often that's just because they have lost a resistance allele. But occasionally we see genomes where we would predict these isolates are resistant, but actually the MICs are um, two or more doubling dilutions uh, less than what we would expect. So this is particularly uh, prevalent for azithromycin, but we also see it for other important antibiotics like ceftriaxone and ciprofloxacin. So we were interested in understanding what the genetic mechanism of this increased susceptibility was. And to do that, we used a genome-wide association study. So there are many different strategies you could imagine for doing a genome-wide association study in bacteria, but we think that this linear mixed model strategy um, provides uh, you know, the highest number of true positives compared to false positives. So I just thought I'd walk you through how we do this a little bit. Um, we start with our genome assemblies, as well as our phenotype, in this case, MICs, uh, to our drugs of interest. And then we describe genetic variation in the population by using the presence or absence of unitigs. And for those of you who maybe are a little, haven't heard of unitigs before, um, we think that this is the best way to describe variation, both because uh, these sequences can really capture a diverse uh, uh, kind of mechanisms of, of resistance like SNPs and indels or gene presence absence, but they also reduce the computational resources needed for bacterial gene GWAS compared to something like KMERS, which would also capture all of that variation. So you can see in the top, you know, we have this graph associated with a single nucleotide variant. And uh, you know, with a camer size of four, that single nucleotide, nucleotide variant is represented by four different camers, which we would need to test. However, if we use a compacted graph and only include a single unitig for each of these unique sequences, we have fewer association tests that we need to do. We can also include the presence or absence of previously described loci in our GWAS, which I'll come back to later in the talk. But lastly, we also always estimate the phylogeny, and we do that so that we can control for population structure. So in bacteria, population structure can contribute to false positives in your GWAS analysis. So let's say, hypothetically, we were interested in trying to figure out what the underlying genetic variation was that was contributing to ciprofloxacin resistance. I already told you we know that this is um, this single SNP in gyre A, but if we were doing a GWAS for this and we didn't control for population structure, what we would see is that all of the variation that's linked to gyre A in these larger clades that are resistant to ciprofloxacin would also be um, significantly associated in our GWAS. So it would be more difficult for us to uh, tease apart what are probably actual causal variants from linked variation in large clades. So instead, we um, create the phylogeny, 
and we uh, take that phylogeny and create a, a similarity matrix of all of the isolates in our population and use that as a random effect in our linear mixed model, which does a great job of controlling false positives due to lineage. So in the linear mixed model, we are trying to predict our uh, uh, phenotype, in this case, log transformed MICs, uh, with the presence or absence of known loci, plus each individual unitag controlling for population structure. And at the end, uh, we can see these kind of distinct peaks on a Manhattan plot associated with regions of the genome that are associated with our phenotype. So here I'm showing the results for three different GWATs for azithromycin, centraxone, and ciprofloxacin. So you can see that uh, we have peaks of variants that are associated with persistence. So these are uh, variants that have beta, value, beta values in the linear mixed model that are greater than zero. They're associated with an increase in MIC. And those correspond to the known resistance uh, markers in, for these drugs. So that was great. It was kind of like a... Uh, positive control for our GWAS. But what we also saw is that there's this variant in a gene called MTRC that was associated with increased susceptibility to all three drugs. Uh, so this variant um, is associated with uh, negative beta value, so and a decrease in MICs. And when we took a look at what the actual sequence of the unitake was, it corresponded to this dinu uh, deletion in a dinucleotide repeat region in MTRC, which leads to a frame shift and loss of function. MTRC encodes a part of the MTR efflux pump, which is the major antibiotic efflux pump in Neisseria gonorrhea. And so it's not surprising that loss of function of this pump would increase antibiotic susceptibility. Uh, what was kind of surprising was that we were seeing it in around 1 in 25 isolates in our um, uh, data set. And so you might imagine, okay, maybe uh, this efflux pump, production of the efflux pump has a fitness cost. But when we looked in the lab, we didn't see a fitness cost. Isolates that were um, expressing the pump or not expressing the pump were growing equally well. And in studies in the mouse model of gonorrhea, expression of this pump is associated with a fitness benefit. But because of the frequency at which we were seeing this mutation emerge, we felt like there must be some environment where uh, expression of this pump is actually deleterious. And so, you know, we were thinking about where, where is gonococcus generally living? And I told you before that it is often transmitting between mucosal surface, surfaces in the pharynx, rectum, urethra, and cervix, all of which have different oxygen availability, pH, um, other microbiome. Um, and so we decided to look at the distribution of this mutation across those sites of infection. And what we saw was that uh, in TRC loss of function, mutations are overrepresented in the cervix. And when we looked in the literature, there was some um, evidence to suggest that these pumps do uh, have a fitness cost in anaerobic environments where there is low pH. So that kind of describes the cervix. Um, and so we went looking to see, okay, is this specific to this pump or are other efflexes also being lost in cervical infections? And what we saw is that when we looked across efflux pumps in Nigeria gonorrhea, we were only seeing loss of function in these proton-dependent efflux pumps. So we saw it in MTR, but we also saw it in a different pump, FAR AB. And again, in FAR AB, these loss of function mutations uh, were associated with cervical infections. And we have some other analyses uh, that uh, I think provide further support that this loss of function mutation is really associated with an adaptation to the cervix that I won't talk about today just for time reasons, but I'm happy to talk about it uh, later on if anyone's interested. So just some conclusions from this part of the talk. We use GWAS to identify loss of function mutations that increase susceptibility to multiple antibiotics and thanks to your And it seems like these loss of function mutations are actually being selected for because it, uh, they are adaptive in the cervical environment. So next I'll move on to identifying targets for point of care diagnostics. So normally when a patient comes into the clinic with gonorrhea, 
um, or for asymptomatic screening, they are diagnosed with a nucleic acid amplification test. So basically, we're just looking for the presence of genomic DNA from Neisseria gonorrhea in the patient sample. That means a clinician, you know, we're not culturing these bacteria, we're not doing susceptibility testing, and so a clinician only has treatment guidelines uh, set by CDC to kind of inform their antibiotic choice. So you can see those treatment guidelines have changed dramatically over the years, and this is because of what I was telling you earlier, that once 5% of gonococci are resistant, we don't use that drug anymore. However, in a genomic epidemiology study we did a few years ago with the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, we found that the largest transmission clusters that we've reconstructed from genomic data are actually susceptible to both the current therapy at the time, which was ceftriaxone and acisamycin, as well as susceptible to ciprofloxacin, which is a previous therapy. Uh, so that really suggests that if we do something about antimicrobial resistance or susceptibility in the clinic at point of care, we could potentially be using a more diverse panel of antibiotics. Um, and this, you know, using a diverse panel would probably reduce selection pressure for the evolution of resistance to ceftriaxone, which is really our last uh, antibiotic choice right now. And this idea is actually already being implemented. There's a diagnostic called resistance plus TC made by Speedex, which has been approved in Europe, um, and I think it's you know, being reviewed here in the United States, which uses this gyre A SNP to identify whether or not uh, a gonococcal infection is susceptible to cipro uh, yeah, ciprofloxacin uh, at the time of diagnosis. However, modeling studies have shown that if we only look for susceptibility to one drug uh, in a point of care setting, we might act actually drive multi-drug resistance. And so we were interested in understanding, um, you know, it, would it be possible to develop these kind of diagnostics for other drugs where multiple mechanisms of resistance are contributing to uh, MICs? So we focused on penicillin and tetracycline, which were used for gonorrhea treatment for decades until around the 1980s. Um, and like I just mentioned, there are multiple pathways to resistance. High-level resistance is mediated by these plasmid-encoded genes. Uh, one encodes beta-lactamase, which encodes resistance to penicillin, and the other is TET-M, which encodes resistance to tetracycline. And so we would certainly want to include uh, those genes in our potential diagnostic. However, there's also a whole bunch of chromosomally encoded mutations that mediate susceptibility, including mutations in uh, an the antibiotic targets, as well as mutations that upregulate that efflux pump that I was just talking about, or change uh, expression or uh, sort of the size of the foreign in the outer membrane. And the kind of technology that people are using right now to do to you know develop point of care diagnostics do not allow us to we are just in an unlimited number of loci. Um, and so we really wanted to understand which particular genes we should focus on if we were to develop a diagnostic. I mean, for me, I would love it if, you know, we were out here doing nanopore sequencing uh, in, in the clinic and getting whole genome se sequences, but for a pathogen that's causing, you know, probably a, a million infections every year in the United States, that's also just not cost-effective. So once again, um, we turn to a GWAS approach. And so we use the same general um, structure that I talked about before, but this time we specifically added the presence of these uh, plasmid encoded loci that are associated with high level resistance into our GWAS. So that what we're really asking is that given the presence or absence of the plasmid, what are the chromosomal loci that are most contributing to susceptibility? And here we're really focused on uh, variants that are associated with susceptibility, not resistance. And that's because in this case, uh, you know, public health agencies and clinicians are already assuming the bacteria is resistant. I mean, that's why we're not using the antibiotic in the first place. So the idea for these diagnostics is that we would want to um, identify susceptible bacteria and be confident that we could treat with that antibiotic. So here's our result for the uh, penicillin conditional GWAS. And we do see uh, susceptibility associated variants in um, 
the efflux pump and MTRC, as well as pore B, which is leporin. But we also see a peak in pen A, which encodes the target of penicillin. And the variant in pen A actually has the highest impact on susceptibility. Um, it has the you know, highest absolute value of beta in the linear mix model. And so we decided to focus on that variant. And what's kind of neat about this sequence is that it actually differentiates susceptible allele from two different known resistance alleles. Um, one is a, a insertion at codon 345 in pen A, and then the other are these mosaic alleles that have been acquired from commensal Neisseria, which while they don't have that insertion, have quite a different sequence in the same region. And if we combine that particular sequence with the absence of the beta-lactamase gene, we can predict sensitive uh, susceptibility with very high specificity, both in our global data set, uh, which we used for the GWAS, but also in a validation data set of surveillance data from here in the United States. I'm not gonna go through all of the tetracycline GWAS results in detail, but um, just in summary, we found a very similar situation where we have a sequence in the target of tetracycline, our PSJ, combined with the absence of ted -Ed, predicts susceptibility with very high specificity. And so what we found is that while uh, you can't predict penicillin or tetracycline susceptibility with just one locus, we could potentially predict susceptibility with two, um, which I think is, uh, you know, reasonable to be included in something like a multiplex PCR. You may have noticed on my slides that um, while we had pretty high uh, specificity, sensitivity was only moderate. So, you know, it's possible that if we added a few other uh, targets into the diagnostic, we could predict uh, susceptibility with higher sensitivity. However, I will say there's not an obvious, you know, third um, locus to include. The variation in the efflux pump and in the porin is quite diverse. So including any one of those variants doesn't actually increase sensitivity that much. Um, and we also think that conditional GWAS that's focused on variants specifically associated with susceptibility rather than those associated with resistance, which is what most people have been um, kind of focused on with good reason thus far, uh, might be a promising approach to identify targets for diagnos diagnostics. Uh, and before I kind of move on to the last part of my talk, I did want to talk a little bit about when, when does this GWAS strategy fail? Um, you know, I told you that bacterial genomes have many repetitive regions which are hard to assemble with short reads. And the input to our GWAS are de novo assemblies. So uh, we are missing some important variation in the gonococcal population just because uh, we can't resolve those regions. So an example is this OPA gene, which is present in nine to 11 copies across the genome. And it's very important for, it, it encodes an outer membrane protein, which can um, bind to host cells, but is also important for immune evasion. And it's just difficult to assess the impact of variation in this gene on our phenotypes because, uh, you know, short read data, uh, we cannot resolve the multiple copies of this gene. Additionally, this gene has a long run of pentanucleotide repeats, which the change in length changes whether or not this gene is expressed because it causes frame shifts. And that's another thing that is difficult to resolve with short reads. However, we think that uh, with the advent of long read nanopore sequencing and um, you know, kind of the improvements in quality uh, of the base calling, we will be able to solve this issue. The other time that our GMO strategy fails is when there are many rare variants that kind of all contribute to the same phenotype. So for example, here I'm showing a tree um, with, annotated with sexual behavior, but also uh, premature stop codons in a gene called NORB. And we think that this is another gene that uh, where loss of function is associated with cervical infections. However, we wouldn't be able to pick this up in a GWAS because loss of function in NORB is caused by uh, a diverse set of mutations, unlike MTRC. So, you know, we see lots of function caused by frame shifts, 
because of one base pair insertions, but also 14 base pair insertions. We see nonsense mutations. There might be other ones out there that I just haven't observed yet in our data. And so, uh, you know, something that I am thinking about and would be really excited to work on if anyone in this room is also interested is, is trying to actually annotate that graph um, that we're creating our unitigs from and combining those unitigs based on their predicted uh, sort of functional effect, like combining all the unitigs that might be associated with a premature stop codon or uh, non-synonymous mutations in particular domains of proteins. So lastly, I'll just talk about our work trying to understand the impact of interventions like changes in antimicrobial use on pathogen populations. So I told you that rates of gonorrhea are increasing, but um, this is actually true across a number of bacterial STIs. So rates of chlamydia are increasing, rates of syphilis are increasing. And I think especially for syphilis, which can have extremely um, severe outcomes uh, in uh, for neonates, um, this is quite concerning. And you might have seen in the news this uh, idea of a morning after pill for STIs. So in clinical trials in the last few years, um, people have been testing the idea of doxycycline post-exposure prophylaxis. So this is taking a single dose of the antibiotic doxycycline within 24 hours, ideally, of um, a potential exposure to a bacterial STI. And doxycycline post-exposure prophylaxis actually has very good efficacy against chlamydia and syphilis. And so it is already being ruled out uh, it, in some public health departments here in the United States. So for example, I know in San Francisco, uh, but also the CDC is working on interim guidance about who should be offered uh, doxycycline post-exposure prophylaxis. Now in the clinical trials, uh, doxypep worked against chlamydia and syphilis, but it doesn't work quite as well against gonorrhea. And that's because of pre-existing tetracycline resistance in uh, the gonococcal population. So I just told you a lot about tetracycline resistance uh, in our uh, diagnostic study. And doxycycline and tetracycline are in the same antibiotic class. And so while we don't know a lot about exactly what the cutoffs are for doxycycline, we think that probably it's not as effective because we know that part of the gonococcal population is already resistant to tetracycline. We also know that um, the sort of widespread introduction of doxypep is going to really increase doxycycline consumption by probably millions of doses monthly. And particularly in populations where gonorrhea is likely to be circulating. And so um, we were kind of interested in what is the potential impact of use of doxycycline, especially this very heavy use of doxycycline on persistence in gonococcus. I just told you we don't have official breakpoints for doxycycline, but the MICs to doxycycline are similar to tetracycline. And so we think that the resistance mechanisms are likely to be the same. What we don't know is if doxycycline use will select only for this high level plasmid encoded resistance, or you know, if any strain that's resistant to tetracycline will also be resistant to doxycycline. Particularly, particularly in the setting where you know patients are only taking one pill um, rather than like a whole course of doxycycline. The other thing uh, that we don't know is how this might impact resistance to other antimicrobials. So often when a uh, gonococcus is resistant to one antibiotic, it's resistant to other antibiotics. Uh, and so whether or not uh, Doxypep selects for high level resistance to tetracycline or just all tetracycline might also impact other antimicrobial resistance to the population. So we looked in our collection of genomes where we can actually work out what the mechanism of resistance is as well as paired tetracycline MICs. And what we found is that actually um, tetracycline isolates that are have high level resistance to tetracycline actually have lower levels of uh, resistance to other antimicrobials than those that have chromosome-related resistance. So there's the potential that if 
doxycycline use is really strongly selecting for this high level resistance, at least in the near term, it's not going to be selecting as much for resistance to other important antimicrobials. However, if doxycycline use just, you know, selects for all tetracycline resistance, we might also see uh, increased resistance to drugs like ciprofloxacin, which isn't great because right now we are trying to introduce a diagnostic to um, hopefully reintroduce ciprofloxacin into use. And so um, some conclusions we have from this work is that the near-term impact of doxycycline prep on AMR is really going to be influenced on the strength of selection for TET-M versus um, chromosomally encoded resistance. But really, you know, what we need is genomic surveillance among doxypep users. Um, there hasn't been a lot of data that come, has come out of the clinical trials or um, out of, you know, these regions where doxypep is already in use about when these populations do have gonorrhea infections, what is antimicrobial uh, resistance look like? And so just to kind of summarize everything, today I told you about how we can use GWAS to identify novel contributors to antimicrobial susceptibility. And we can also use conditional GWAS to identify targets for diagnostics. And then lastly, um, genomics can inform the potential impact of new interventions um, like changing antimicrobial use. So I told you all that I'm a new assistant professor. I just started my lab in August and while I've uh, talked a lot about gonococcus today, we work on a, a diverse array of pathogens. And so we're really interested in understanding how pathogens adapt to hosts and sites of infection, continuing to use genomic epidemiology to understand how they're transmitting in populations, um, improving diagnostics, and also understanding the impact of uh, changing antimicrobial use on these people populations. And so if any of that interests you, please get in touch. I have my email address on my website here. All of this work uh, on pathogen genomics really uh, takes a village. Um, so I'd like to thank, you know, everyone, a lot of this work I did as a postdoc, so um, folks in my postdoc lab, but also all of our collaborators who were involved either in the collection of the isolates, um, or uh, the sort of public health interpretation of the results. Okay, any questions? So I have. Um, so I had a couple questions that now that I'm thinking about it might only apply to larger genomes since like uh, like I'm more of a plant person, but I'll ask them anyway. Um, so in your so in your kind of GWAS approach, you said you used a linear mixed model. Um, were those uh, did you use a single locus model or a multi loci model? So uh, we are testing just a single locus at a time. I mean, we test every possible variant and then sort of correct for multiple hypothesis testing, right. uh, except in the case where we're conditioning on the presence or absence of like a previously described locus. So we can add terms for, you know, uh, other loci, but we're not like individually testing or testing multiple variants of the same model. Does okay. that answer your question? Um, yeah, yeah. And then also like, for like for this specific pathogen, like what is the what does the LD decay look like? It is very recombinogenic um, because it's taking up DNA all the time. Uh, LD does decay pretty fast in gonococcus, and yet we still have this problem with population structure. It's even the population structure issue is even more uh, severe in other pathogens that don't. Uh, Recombine as much. So, so they, I mean, there are some pathogens like Mycobacterium tuberculosis, which don't recombine at all. They're completely clonal. So it's very um, pathogen. Yes, we have a Zoom question. We have a Zoom chat question from Kelvin Luther, who asks With increased use of something like doxycycline, is increased monitoring for rarer serious side effects like pericarditis? Um, I don't know exactly what they're planning as far as like um, monitoring and surveillance uh, as 
as Dot CPAP is rolled out, although I'm going to CDC to meet with the STI for there on Tuesday, so I might uh, have an answer for you then, but I don't know like what their plans are for monitoring for side effects. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, in the mixed model, uh, for the response variable, did you put the the measurement of the phenotype for some changes in that measurement? Yeah, so we um, used uh, the MIC. So that's, a, you know, like the concentration of the drug that inhibits growth. But we do log transform it because it's measured in these doubling dilutions. Um, you may have noticed that, like, all, all of my plots of MICs are also on a log scale. It just the, the linear mixed model performs well when you log transform rather than if you just use the raw values, you're only going to find variants that are impacting, like, the very most resistant bacteria. Yes. Are there any natural lytic phage to gonorrhea that can be exported as like phage serum? Yeah, so gonorrhea has some, uh, some phage in the genome that we're not really sure what they're doing or if they're active. Um, and But to my knowledge, I don't know if uh, there are known lytic phage. I know that people are looking for them because, um, for example, you could imagine that if there was a phage that used that efflux pump as a target, um, you could administer the phage and an antibiotic at the same time. And so the bacteria either lose the pump to be resistant to the phage, but then they're going to be susceptible to antibiotics, or um, they keep the pump, but then they're susceptible to the phage. So it's definitely folks are looking for lytic phage, but I don't know that anyone's found one yet. Yes. Just had a general behavioral question. Um, I just was really surprised that you said like there was a lowest level of gonorrhea was in 2009. I guess I would have assumed it would have been like pandemic. Why is it increasing since then? Is it because it's... Um, it's just more resistant? Or is there like a behavioral change, birth control method? What yes. Uh, so I think, um, you know, it's interesting. We didn't see like a huge dip during the pandemic, but also like diagnose, diagnosis during the pandemic was a little weird because we kind of ran out of like most of the um, PCR uh, materials were going to like COVID diagnostics. And so some health department, departments had to return to trying to like culture bacteria. And so I'm not sure how much to trust the like pandemic surveillance num numbers. Um, but I think probably the reason, one of the reasons it's contributing to the rise of STIs is actually the availability of HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis, which is wonderful. I am like, you know, that's been a game changer for, for people's health, but it also means that um, I think there's just like less common use, which is allowing other STIs to spread. Yes. Okay, another Zoom question from Dr. Lin Yu, and he asked two questions. The first one is, which aspects of your research could serve as potential research topics for students in bioinformatics? And then as sort of follow-up to that, how would you advise these bioinformatics students? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I am, like I mentioned uh, at kind of the end of the GWAS section, I am very interested in kind of improving our GWAS methods uh, to better capture some of these regions of the genome that are not accessible right now. Um, and I would love to have a student come and work on developing new methods for GWAS to uh, sort of query these more diverse regions of the genomes. Um, you know, I think how how would I advise bioinformatics students? Uh, I, I'm not sure sort of what aspect of advising you're both interested in, but um, I, I think my work and my experience, I, I have really enjoyed working at the sort of intersection of computational biology and microbiology. Um, I, I learned bioinformatics as a graduate student uh, from, from not even knowing what the command line was. And so I think I'm well-equipped to teach 
folks um, how to how to do that as well, and and really connect students with projects that are impactful for public health through all of my collaborations with patients and um, public health departments. So I don't know if that answered the question, but yes, we have a, another Zoom question from Dr. Summers who asks, uh, why do mutations to resistance persist? They are assumed to be deleterious, and is there increased regain of function? Yeah, so um, why uh, uh, bacteria maintain antibiotic resistance mutations? Particularly, I mean, some of these drugs we haven't been using for gonorrhea treatment for a while, and yet the bacteria are still maintaining resistance. So this is a question I'm uh, also very interested in, I didn't talk about it today, but we've been using uh, sort of GWAS-like approaches to try and identify compensatory mutations. So these are mutations in other parts of the genome that are associated with uh, these resistance mutations and may compensate for fitness costs, which allow the bacteria to maintain resistance and, and still transmit just as well as susceptible bacteria in the absence of antibiotics. Um, the other thing is that, like I mentioned, uh, antimicrobial resistance is often linked in the same strain background. So even though uh, you know we're not using these some antibiotics anymore, we're still using other antibiotics that these strains are too. So you just have uh, selection because they're actually linked. Um, but this is definitely an area of interest for me, and so. Again, if, if folks are interested in working on trying to identify compensatory mutations um, or just lineages that are more likely to evolve resistance, uh, I would be happy uh, to talk about it. All right. Well, if there's more <laughs> questions, let's all thank uh, Dr. Thank you. Uh,